Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Philip Stashenko to you today. Dr. Stashenko received his DMD degree from Harvard University and subsequently completed his PhD in immunology with Dr. Stuart Schlossman. He then pursued training in endodontics at Harvard University. He continued his education with postdoc experiences in immunology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Stashenko entered the professorial ranks in the early 1990s at Harvard. In parallel to this, he was appointed as a member of Foresight Institute. He progressed through, through several member ranks, and since 2008, Dr. Stashenko is president and chief executive officer of the Foresight Institute. He is on the scientific advisory board of several industrial institutions and on the editorial board of several international journals such as International Journal of Oral Biology, Odontology, and Dur Journal of Dental Research. Dr. Sashenko was recently identified as one of the top 5% recipients of NIH grant funding over the past 25 years. His research contributions include understanding the role of IL-1 beta as an important bone resorptive cytokine, characterization of protective and destructive immune mechanisms in oral infections, identification of genes critical for bone, for bone resorption, and regulation of osteoclast formation. He is known for the discovery of the B cell marker CD20, and antibodies towards this protein are now used to treat certain types of lymphoma. His research led to several patents related to osteoblast, osteoclast, characterization of methods for periodontic and endodontic treatments, and methods for culturing a biological tooth. His current work focuses on their interactions among T cell subsets in regulating alveolar bone destruction. In addition to his sustained research, Dr. Stashenko has formally mentored more than 40 students for master's and doctoral degrees. So Dr. Stashenko is an outstanding dentist scientist, and it is a wonderful role model for students who are starting their careers. Um, and we are privileged to have him with us today to talk about the role of research in the Dental School mission. Thank you very much for that very, very kind introduction. And I want to especially thank uh, Charlotte uh, for inviting me here today to give a keynote talk and also to meet with so many very inspired and uh, fun students to talk to this morning and at lunch today. And also uh, Peter Polverini, who, well, we go back quite a ways, and we'll tell some stories about him later. But. <laughs> I'm really honored to be, to be asked to, uh, to participate in this research day. It's really exciting to see how much enthusiasm there is within the School of Dentistry for research, either as uh, a full-time career or as integrated into the fabric of your curriculum. I think it's extremely important. And I know that uh, Dean Polverini is at the forefront of emphasizing the importance of research and the mission of the dental school. So you're all very fortunate to have his leadership here. So without further ado, so what I'm going to tell you about today is some background on my institution, Forsyth Institute. I'm going to talk a little bit about my view on why our profession needs great science as well as great clini clinicians, uh, a glimpse into a research career, that is to say my own research career and some of the influences that, that affected me and allowed me to be successful uh, in, this, in this career, uh, something about the commonalities of success factors uh, in science, and to talk a little bit about how exciting it is to be considering a career in science at this particular time in history. I know there's a lot of challenges connected with science these days in terms of funding and so on and so forth, but at the same time, there's never been a more opportune moment 
to uh, make tremendous progress against oral diseases and associated systemic diseases. So the, here's a, uh, a picture of our iconic 1910 building, the Forsyth Institute. Some of you have passed through these, through our halls over the years. There's a number of faculty here who have uh, been at Forsyth or even trained at Forsyth here at the University of Michigan. And currently we have about 30 principal investigators. We are a research institute. That is our, our primary mission. Um, and uh, last year we did about $14 million of research, uh, about 70% via NIH, the rest via corporate uh, and other federal uh, agency support. And our research focus areas uh, really center on infectious disease, microbiology and immunology. Uh, I would have to say that uh, Forsyth probably is the world's leading institution in the world in the area of oral microbiology. Uh, and we've also, uh, we have very strong programs also in skeletal biology and biomineralization, developmental biology, and a very strong clinical research component. We've always been very focused on translating basic science to the benefit of people. So there's always that uh, in the back of everyone's mind. Uh, just to give you an idea of some of the work, the breakthrough work that's been done at Forsyth over the years, the identification of the specific bacterial complexes that cause periodontal disease and the pathogens of dental decay, uh, research into the protective mechanisms of fluoride. At Forsyth, there have been uh, prototype vaccine developed against dental decay. The first local delivery device to treat periodontal disease, Actocyte, was developed by Max Goodson in the 1990s. And by the way, Max is bringing this back, for those of you who, are, who may be interested. Uh, the first oral pathogen genome project was completed at Forsyth for P. gingivalis. And we had the first uh, NIDCR-funded oral metagenomics project under the, under the direction of Floyd Dewhurst, which is still in progress. Um, we've identified uh, all of the 700 plus bacteria that can colonize the human oral cavity and developed the gene chip to rapidly identify these organisms and study the ecology of the oral cavity. Uh, some of the work that was alluded to was done in, in my group, identifying novel osteoclast genes and looking at bone loss and mechanisms of bone loss in periodontal disease, but also in um, other uh, diseases of bone resorption, novel biophysical mechanisms that control development, and also photobiology. So we have a diverse portfolio, but really a lot of it centers around infectious disease research. Forsyth uh, is moving from its historic home this fall. And uh, instead of being in the lab and doing all the interesting things that I could be doing there, I've been overseeing this process for the past several years, first to identify a site and now to actually renovate it and build it out. And Forsyth's new home is going to be just across the Charles River in the Kendall Square area of Cambridge. And this is a, a, an aerial view that shows the Cambridge Science Center, which is right on the Charles River, right over the Longfellow Bridge across from Mass General Hospital. And it's really a three building complex of a lab building, an atrium, and an office and clinical uh, tower. So that's going to be our new location. Here's the lab building from the front. We already have our sign up here through the magic of, of, of Photoshop. <laughs> uh, this is the atrium. Uh, and with a snack shop there, they do sell Fenway Franks, in case you want to come by. This is a view from the fifth floor laboratory space, and it really has a gorgeous view looking back toward Boston. So if anyone's interested in coming to Boston to see our new space, we'll be happy to give you a tour. And this is a view from the boss's office, so I can think lofty thoughts, hopefully. But it's a wonderful site. It's, uh, it's a little bit further away from the Longwood Medical Area and Harvard Dental School than, than we would like it to be. On the other hand, it's very close within walking distance to MIT, the Broad Institute, and uh, all of the Cambridge Biotech companies. So we'll retain our historic connections with Longwood and the Harvard hospitals, but we'll establish new ones in Cambridge. So, I think what I'm really here to talk about today, though, is not Forsyth, but rather 
to give you a few of my thoughts on why science really has to be integral to the fabric of the dental school curriculum. And the, and the first and most important thing to my way of thinking is that science and the new knowledge that are, is developed are essential for progress in our profession. That is to develop better means of diagnosis, prevention, and treatment for our patients. So without a scientific component to the profession, the profession will never progress beyond where it is now. And clearly, there's, there's room for a lot of improvement, especially in terms of prevention, because the common oral diseases are, after all, infections, and they're preventable diseases, largely preventable. Uh, I think another factor is, these days, the great research universities, like the Un University of Michigan, obviously, expect that all of its schools are going to be science or research-based. And this is true uh, at Harvard and all of the leading uh, research institutions in the country that have dental schools. Finally, and also very important, if it doesn't happen in dental schools and dental institutes, it won't happen anywhere. That is the creation of new knowledge that's pertinent to the practice of dentistry. There's a lot of talk about NIDCR as a funding uh, institute being absorbed into other NIH institutes. With the, the questions often asked, well, why can't our immunology programs go into allergy and infectious disease, for example? Well, the reason is because then no one there was really committed to our problems. No one there is really interested in them in the same way that we are. So it's extremely important that dental schools maintain a research focus and a research, uh, and that research intensive dental schools in particular uh, maintain that focus. So academic dentistry today is clearly changing. I mean, you have, you have three groups of, of schools. You have the research intensive here on the left, uh, and for political reasons, I put Michigan first. <laughs> and I included Forsyth because we're, we're, we're comrades, obviously. But on, on, on the right, the, more, the, the new schools that are popping up all over the country really are clinical, clinically oriented. They have essentially no research mission. I've, I've uh, asterisked ASDO because I think that at least they have a public health, a strong public health mission. And then there are all the schools in between. But I think it's, it's the schools that are research intensive that have this, this commitment to science and to improving the profession that are so critical to the profession of dentistry. Um, research intensive dental schools are really facing a lot of challenges these days. Clearly, research although it's a wonderful thing, loses money. It has to be subsidized. We understand that as a research institute because we don't have other uh, revenue or many other revenue streams to offset the costs of doing business. Uh, whereas at least in your environment, you do have tuition and other, and other uh, revenue streams. Nevertheless, it's always a challenge. This is a very unfortunate trend. NIDCR research funding to dental institutions is now only about 50% of its extramural budget, down from about 70% a decade ago. So more and more of NIDCR's research money is going outside of our community to medical schools and hospitals. So this is something that we really need to make an effort to, to reverse. So our profession really needs a concerted commitment to the, what I call the academy, that is the cadre of people, the faculty who are really committed to developing new knowledge to science and to advancing the profession. So not everybody wants to be a scientist. I'm, I know I spoke to a lot of students this morning. The, obviously, the, the people who are in the, the, the PhD program or the DDS PhD programs are quite committed. Uh, on the other hand, you know, many, most people come to dental school to become practicing dentists. Nevertheless, science is really important for, for enhancing this educational experience as well. In general, it raises the standards of the profession. A dental school without any science uh, in the curriculum or very little science in the curriculum does not have the same texture. It doesn't have the same depth as one that's focused more on, on the technical aspects of dentistry. 
Uh, a science or evidence-based curriculum enhances the educational experience by creating this environment, which I think is really important. And it complements the technical aspects of dentistry with the biologic considerations, that is, the mechanisms of pathogenesis, of disease, the whys, why things happen, and how things could be changed. So all of these are very, very important. In addition, I think if you train in a, in a science-based or research-intensive school and have done some research at least or been exposed to it, I think you will have enhanced critical thinking skills and an ability to evaluate the literature uh, to the benefit of your patients over time. I mean, you can become a lifelong learner if you understand how to read, critically read the literature and understand it. It also contributes to your own teaching and mentoring skills. Many people who go off into practice still want to maintain connection with their school by becoming teachers. And if you have a, a, some research experience, I think it does benefit you in, in, in your teaching skills as well. In addition, first-hand understanding of how new knowledge is developed is, is an important thing. Before I went into research, I really didn't understand how the information contained in my science textbooks was developed. When you see how it actually happens firsthand, it's really quite eye-opening. It takes a long time. It's very arduous. Uh, it involves an element of luck, all of that. But at, at the same time, you, you really understand what the process is, the scientific process. And finally, uh, and I mentioned this to some of the students I just met with, an informed clinician can be a thought leader for basic and translational scientists. If you look at medicine as a model here, there are many heads of large departments in medical schools that have very intense research programs. The heads of these departments are not necessarily scientists themselves, but they are clinicians with an appreciation of science. And they can assemble the teams who can actually do the basic and translational work. I think we need more of this in dentistry. So for all of these reason, reasons, I think it's very important that science be stressed uh, in the dental school curriculum. So I'm going to talk a little bit about now about my own experience and uh, what led me to become engaged in a scientific uh, career. And I think this, this aphorism uh, from Confucius kind of sums it up for me. That is, choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. And I really feel this way, that if I've loved uh, every, every day of my career in science and have enjoyed it in just that way. So by way of background, I had done some research as an undergraduate at NYU and a little bit at, at uh, Harvard Dental School. And I would have to say that at best I was kind of an indifferent dental, sc dental student. Uh, I'm not sure what my class rank was, but out of a class of 16, it might have been in the teens someplace. But I did love, uh, I loved the scientific aspects of the curriculum. And it turns out that there was an NIDCR supported training grant for, to get your PhD at Harvard Medical School at that time, which was easy to access. And so I took advantage of that. And I was also accepted into not only a world-class immunology program, but also a cutting-edge basic science lab that, um, that I'll tell you about in just a minute. Another factor to my education was that I did a basic immunology postdoc, which uh, was mentioned just a minute ago. So if there's, if there's less, uh, a first lesson from all of this, it's that I was really lucky to be in the right place place is, that is, some research universities uh, in, in pursuing this career, and also to be in these places at the right time, because at that time, in the 70s, immunology was just emerging as an absolutely uh, leading field. It was in the most exciting time, perhaps, in this field, and a lot of the giants in the field, the leaders, were at Harvard. They had just been recruited from other areas. So you're exposed daily to thought leaders. At every seminar, uh, there was some amazing dialogue that would go on. And it was a totally uh, immersive experience, the, the PhD training, working with really smart people. It was critical thought and data-based. And the focus on discovery made every day a different experience. So there was nothing routine about it. 
So I guess lesson number two for me at least was follow your bliss and uh, do what it is that you really, really want to do, what you really enjoy, what your passion is. For me, it turned out to be science, and, I'm, and I can say that I'm really happy that I chose that path. For others, it, it may be something else. It may be clinical science. In terms of my mentors, this uh, Stu Schlossman was, uh, was at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. He was a T-cell immunologist, and over his career, he published more than 600 publications. He was the second most cited author in the 1980s after Anthony Fauci, which is quite an achievement. His motto was he provided an environment for us to work in. So on our floor at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, there were 70 people working on immunology under Stewart's very loose direction, I would have to say. People had a lot of freedom to pursue their ideas, but it was an environment that had a lot of very smart people in it. So if it didn't matter that Stuart wasn't around to direct your research. You had 15 other postdocs or junior faculty members to talk to. And if you had any question, you could always find someone who could answer your question. In addition, you could always find somebody with a reagent or a technique or a device, a machine, to help you do your experiment. So it was just an absolutely cutting-edge, first-class environment to do research in. Another uh, person who had a lot of influence on me was Baruch Benassaraf, who ended up winning the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1980 for the discovery of major histocompatibility genes. And when I found out that he was going to be the chair of my oral qualifying exam for my PhD, <laughs> I was absolutely terrified because Baruch had this very interesting habit of uh, at a seminar, he would sit right in the front row where, where Dr. Paul Verini is sitting right now, right in front of the speaker, and he would, at the beginning of the seminar, he'd lean his head back and close his eyes, or pretend to close his eyes, and at the end of the seminar, he would open his eyes and he would ask the killer question every time. <laughs> so you knew he was paying attention and you knew exactly how smart this man really was. But the funny thing was that at my qualifying exam, he led off the questioning. And the first question he asked me was, what is an allotype? Which is one of the easiest questions you could possibly ask an immunology student. And then he asked me, what is an idiotype? So he relieved the tension. And he was just very, it was a very kind thing to do. It was done deliberately. And sometime, uh, re actually recently, I had occasion to, to write him a letter about that experience. His picture appeared in the Boston Globe with his wife of 60 years. They were celebrating their 60th anniversary. And it occasioned me to write him a letter thanking him for his kindness in that situation because obviously he could destroy anyone, much less a, a poor PhD student. But uh, he was very kind, and he was a great inspiration to many of the students in the program at that time. His door was always open. You could always go and talk to him, and he was a wonderful man. So, uh, you know, observe, at that time, as I said, the faculty of immunology at Harvard uh, had most of the world leaders in the field uh, there in, at the quad, and you, just observing them, you could see some of the, the common character, personality traits, which which allowed them to be so successful. Clearly, they were all very, very intelligent people, but they're all also very curious, uh, always asking uh, the question, uh, extremely creative. They had great adaptability to change. At the same time, they were very ambitious, very hard driving. And there was a competitive, it was a competitive environment. Obviously, science is competitive. You're competing for grant funding all the time, you're competing to publish your papers, all of that. But there's also sort of an intellectual competition going on all the time. So these are some of the traits that, that all of these uh, leaders in the field certainly possess. So from all of this training experience, I guess lesson number three for me was go for the best. Train in a great environment. Find a mentor that is absolutely the best one in your field who will have you in their lab. You might have to pester them a little bit to get into that lab, but you'll be happy that you did that. 
And the second thing to me is that I think it's very important for, for students who are involved in research to learn in the mainstream of a basic science field and to bring that knowledge back to bear on the problems of dentistry rather than to train uh, in solely in a, a dental research environment. At least for me, that's, that uh, proved to be a very important factor in uh, my, my career development. So, what is this thrill of discovery all about? If you go into dental practice, you, you know you're going to be very successful. You're going to make a lot of money. If you go into science, you may or may not be that successful, and you may or may not make that kind of money. But you do get a lot of other benefits from being in this very exciting career. And one is the thrill of discovering something. So you go through the process of conceiving an idea. And in the environment that I trained in, there was always people to, to debate an idea with, to do thought experiments, to then to design the actual experiments and even use controls. Uh, we learned that fairly early on find technology and collaborators as needed, and there are always people around that you could draw upon, resolve the inevitable glitches, and then if the outcome was as hypothesized, and even if it wasn't, you might end up discovering something that nobody else had ever found before. And when you publish that, then you become immortal because you're in the literature. Nobody could take that away from you. You've discovered something new. And to me, that was that was really cool. I really enjoyed that. So a few of the, uh, the fun moments in the lab. Uh, one was, as was mentioned uh, in the kind introduction, uh, the identification of CD20 as a universal B lymphocyte antigen that's expressed on all B lymphocytes, and the use of anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody to eliminate those cells. And this was ultimately developed into rituximab, which is widely used now for the treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and CLL. So another, another lesson, I think, from this is that technology does indeed drive discovery. So advances in technology and, and monoclonal antibodies at this time in the early 80s were a great technological advance because they had the specificity that was necessary to uh, discriminate different different cell subsets and had just so many, so many different uses. Uh, this, is, this was a, an associated study done at the same time. It involved the first treatment of a human with a monoclonal antibody. And uh, one of the antibodies that came out of one of these uh, hybridoma production exercises seemed to react quite specifically with the tumor cells of one individual patient. And if you can believe it, we were allowed to actually give this antibody to the patient less than six months after we produced it. And it did have temporary beneficial effects in clearing some of the tumor cells from his, from his bloodstream. But I mean, this is almost inconceivable that an experiment like this could be done these days. But at that time, it, it was permitted. And um, it had a great effect on me because it sort of emphasized how exciting translational science really could be. If you could take an idea or a finding one day and six months later put it into a human to at least test the proof of principle, uh, that's, that was pretty thrilling. Uh, another, uh, another discovery from our lab was the uh, purification of what was then known as osteoclast activating factor. OAF had been described in the literature for a long time, but nobody had been able to identify it or characterize it. And working together with Floyd Dewhurst, uh, we managed to do that after a year of purifying bone resorbing activity from the supernatants of human leukopax cells. So we were, we probably processed something like 60, or 60 liters of conditioned medium. And we came down to one single band from an HPLC, as you can see over here on the left, I think. And when the sequence came back, it was the same as interleukin 1 beta. So that was kind of a bummer. You can't win them all. We were hoping for a new, a completely new molecule. On the other hand, it did represent an advance in knowledge in the field. So uh, we're proud of that work, but it, it, 
didn't turn out exactly the way we had anticipated. Uh, we had done a we've done a lot of work over the years in looking at anti-inflammatory cytokines and their regulatory effects on bone resorption, particularly interleukin-10 is a critical anti-inflammatory cytokine in oral infections, and this is just one of the articles uh, in this area. And this graph just shows um, the effects of knocking out either IL-4 or IL-10 on periapical bone destruction. And as you can see, the knockout of IL-4 has absolutely no effect, even though this is the prototype anti-inflammatory TH2 mediator, whereas the knockout of IL-10 has quite a profound effect in increasing bone destruction. So all, all anti-inflammatory cytokines are, uh, are not equivalent. And this just shows some further experiments in mice showing that interleukin-10 knockout animals are very highly susceptible to periodontal bone destruction induced by P. gingivalis in a, in a mouse model. Uh, along the way, because the lab was very interested in bone resorption, we did get into osteoclast biology in quite a significant way uh, using differential hybridization approaches. This was in the early to mid-90s, we cloned several, several of the more important osteoclast genes, including ATP6I, which is a component of the proton pump that acidifies uh, the sub-osteoclastic space and uh, permits bone, uh, bone resorption to occur. And this is the publication that describes the phenotype of the knockout mouse uh, for ATP6I. ATP6I has subsequently been shown by others to be mutated in about 50% of cases of human malignant osteopetrosis. So it did have a clinical ramification. And another of the genes that came out of the original screen was cathepsin K, which uh, is a fairly osteoclast specific uh, enzyme, which was subsequently found to be mutated in pycnodisostosis. So these discoveries now could be done in a few weeks using gene arrays, but this was the day, days before gene arrays when differential hybridization was really only, the only way to, to go at this. So in terms of translational science, as I say, throughout my career, even though I've done a lot of basic stuff, the most immediate gratification for me has been this bench to bedside thing, bench to chair side potential, where you could see a fairly immediate near-term or intermediate-term application of what you were doing. Uh, just to, to kind of close this, this chapter and to tell you about some of the things we've been doing in endodontics, uh, I didn't practice endodontics all that much, but I did become very interested in problems in endodontics, and one of the problems that we are interested in is how to better sterilize root canals during root canal treatment. And one of the other problems is, of course, flare-ups during treatment, acute reinfections, uh, which are mainly due to the outgrowth of residual bacteria, mostly black, mostly black pigmenting anaerobic bacteria of the Prevotella and Porphyromonas uh, genus. And they lead to uh, a lack of patient comfort as well as active infection. So we uh, have devised a, a local delivery device kind of modeled on the actocyte fiber that contains clindamycin instead of tetracycline and used it in a clinical study to show that, in, in fact, you can largely prevent pain, interappointment pain, in individuals who uh, are treated with this fiber, and this fiber is currently licensed and, and in development. So it's this kind of, uh, kind of translational stuff that still excites me when I'm not uh, attempting to herd squirrels in my administrative position. So. But we continue this work. So to sum up my career in science, I'd have to say that I did work hard at it. I spent many long days in the lab concentrated very hard on the problem at hand, but at the same time, we had a lot of fun. We had great fun with, with many, many great colleagues and collaborators who you work closely with each and every day. And again, uh, you felt that you never were really working a day in your life. So 
uh, what are today's hot spots in oral health research? I mean, what is it that we should all be very excited about in terms of the opportunities for the future? Well, one of the things uh, is that we are now in the post-genomic era. Um, the Human Genome Project was completed in 2003. We have the molecular blueprint of life. All three billion base pairs of DNA are, are known. And we find that we have about 23,000 different genes. Not all of their functions are known at this point in time. Interestingly enough, this number is about the same number as the worm C. elegans. So it kind of makes you wonder, you know, what, uh, what all of this DNA is doing. But in any event, we know a lot about the, uh, the basic blueprint of, of the human being. Um, at the same time, we're not alone. Uh, humans are estimated to have about 10 to the 13th cells. However, the bacteria that live on and within us, the microbiome, there are about 10 times more of them than there are of us. So uh, <clears throat> this interaction between us and our microbial passengers, I think, is one of the things that I find really exciting. And this is really a frontier area, especially for oral health research where, as I say, the major or the most common dental diseases are caused by, by bacteria. Also, the oral cavities are just a tremendous model system in which to study these interactions because it's so accessible compared to, say, the gut. It's really hard to get samples out of different parts of the intestine, whereas the mouth, quite easy. Just thought I'd note that mitochondria, which are evolved from bacteria, there's even 10 times more of them. So we're really kind of a, a hodgepodge of different organisms and different DNAs. So if we're looking at what some of the grand opportunities are in oral health research, well, certainly genetics, genomics, and systems biology approaches of, to human oral diseases, I think, uh, are really at the forefront. Because we have all the basic information, now we need to put it together uh, in the context of specific conditions. Oral systemic disease connections. Uh, even though there have been some failed trials, uh, intervention trials in this area, that is, there have been attempts to reduce periodontal disease and see what effects that reduction had on preterm or low birth weight, as well as on a cardiovascular disease. None of them looked very promising. However, if you really look carefully at those trials, and they did cost a lot of money, uh, unfortunately, the interventions didn't work. It was, the interventions were scaling and root planing only, and when you, they did not include antibiotics or any, any further treatment. So they're really ineffective interventions, and, and I really question whether uh, they really tested the hypothesis, and certainly the epidemiologic associations are extremely strong. Certainly the epidemiologic uh, connections between diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and periodontal disease, as well as obesity, are very strong. I don't think anyone would question that. So I believe that this is still a very, very important and viable area going forward. Uh, the development of, of novel antimicrobials to control the oral biofilm and to, uh, to switch it from a pathogenic biofilm to a health-associated biofilm. I think this is a very promising area. Anti-inflammatories uh, also, I think, will, will be extremely important in the coming years, devising new modes of regulating inflammation in the oral cavity. The, ho the oral host microbial interface, I already mentioned. Biological tissue and organ regeneration, I think, is going to be extremely, extremely important. I say biological because I think that this field has been um, perhaps overly influenced by the surgical approaches in the past. That is, you make a scaffold, seed the scaffold with cells, put the put the construct into a site and expect a tissue or an organ to regenerate. I think we're, we've gone beyond that now and we're much more focused on using the body's own stem cells and reprogramming cells to, to uh, be stem cells uh, and to exert their biological potential, I think, is the way that the, the field is now evolving. 
And finally, I mentioned new models of prevention and health care delivery that reach the underserved. Uh, before I sat in the chair I'm sitting in now, I wasn't particularly interested in public health, but Forsyth does have a, a program in the community called Forsyth Kids that treats 5,000 children in underserved communities in eastern Massachusetts. And I've become very, very interested in this, in this area since, um, since we are, are so involved in it as an institution. When you look nationwide at, at uh, dentistry and the problem of oral disease, 80% of the disease occurs in 20% of the population. Our challenge is how to bring prevention and treatment and care to this 20% of the population in the most effective manner. And I think that this is going to be a very, very promising uh, area for not only for research, but also an important area that dentistry as a profession becomes actively engaged in. So um, I think the time is right. The opportunities abound for a lifetime of oral and systemic health. And I think you here in this room, students, faculty, uh, are in a place where it can happen and it must happen because you really are at the forefront of, of the leading institutions in, in research in oral health. And again, if we don't do it, no one else will, will do it. So just to sum up then the lessons for today, train in the best environment with the be very best people. Yes, do a research postdoc if you're going to go into research full time. Master and apply the latest and best technologies to the problems of oral health because technology does drive discovery. Translational science opportunities abound today as never before. Seek them out with your clinician colleagues if you're scientists or if you're <coughs> clinicians, seek out scientists to help you uh, to solve these problems and follow your bliss and enjoy the journey. It's been a great journey for me, and I hope it is for many of you, too. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.